A few years before the tragic death of Princess Diana, Prince Charles of England took Princess Di with him to Rome. They made a pilgrimage to Rome, met the Holy Father, and one of their stops was in Florence, where they visited a beautiful old monastery overlooking the city called San Miniato al Monte. A childhood friend of mine and a Benedictine, Father Luke Mancuso, happened to be stationed at that monastery, and because, of course, he spoke English, the abbot asked him to guide Prince Charles and Princess Di through the ruins and uh, the great artistic treasures they had there. And my friend Father Luke said to me after the visit that he was quite impressed by their interest in our Catholic faith and in this shrine, and he wouldn't be surprised if at some point one or both might become Catholic. At the end of the visit, he took them to their gift shop where they, the monks had honey from their bees and various kinds of gifts, including beautiful religious art and artifacts. And so they presented a number of these things that the prince and princess were interested in, and they had no money to pay with, no money to donate to the monastery, so they were a little bit embarrassed. By the way, they don't even carry identity cards, no driver's license. The royals in England carry no identification. Do you know why? Well, everyone presumes you know who the royals are, of course. So they need no identification. Everyone knows them very publicly. Today we celebrate a king who was unknown, his royalty hidden. And the only way you knew he was truly the king of all kings and the lord of lords is by your faith. There was no public knowledge of who this was hanging on the cross except to the believers. Now think about it. There you hear words like, take yourself down off this cross. Does that sound familiar to you? It should. Because the tempter who left him for a little while after the temptations in the desert used a very similar tactic long before the crucifixion. Before Jesus began his public ministry, what did he say? As he took him to the heights of the temple in Jerusalem, he says, throw yourself down from this parapet. The angels of God will catch you. Remember, he's, he's tempting Jesus all the way at the beginning of his ministry, and then he does it again at the end and conclusion of his ministry to the voices of the people around him, including one of the thieves. Notice Jesus was crucified with two thieves, one on either side. One of them is shouting at him, save us and save yourself. He wants a quick fix, right? He wants to be taken off that cross. But the other thief, strangely enough, the thief we call the good thief because he steals heaven at the end, that thief, whose name we believe is Dismas, chides the other thief and says, we're getting what we deserve. This man does not. He perceives something else in Jesus. Now, to our knowledge, he wasn't there when Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount. He didn't have the benefit of seeing Jesus heal the sick. He wasn't there when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. He wasn't there when he fill in the blank. But somehow, some way, this man understood what Jesus said in the 10th chapter of John's Gospel. When Jesus gave his teaching on the Good Shepherd, this man understood these words. Jesus said, quote, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. What kind of a king is Jesus? He is the shepherd king prophesied by Isaiah who would suffer for his flock. Now maybe this thief knew that prophecy. 
And so what does he say to Jesus? Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Just the other day, I had a second grader unbaptized in our school, parents, I believe evangelicals, who wait until a person asks for baptism. The second grader had asked her mom to get baptized recently, and the mother asked, well, why, sweetheart, do you want to be baptized? She said, well, all the other girls in my class are baptized. And the mother said, that's not a good enough reason. And she's right. So another day, the little girl came to her mother with an answer. And the mother said, now we must see the priest. So I went over to school, the mother's there in the office, and the little second grader's brought in. And I get to meet her and ask her, so why do you want to be baptized? And the little girl said, on her own, because I want to be in the kingdom of God. Second grader, I wish some of my adults had gotten that answer. <laughs> I want to be in the kingdom of God. Absolutely. That's the whole point. That's our mission in life, to be members of the family of the king. The king of kings and the Lord of lords. Not a king who can give you an earthly kingdom, but a king who can give you everlasting life. A king who's opened the gates of paradise for us. A king whose throne is not a golden throne in a paradise on earth, but a throne on a cross who's knocking at our doors. He will never, this king will never, ever force entry into the kingdom. He completely respects the freedom that he gave the human being. And he knocks at the door and waits. Do you remember that beautiful picture of Jesus knocking at a door and the door is closed. There's no handle. There's no knob on his side. And in fact, there are vines all around it. It looks as though that door had been closed for a long time. And Jesus is knocking and waiting for the person on the inside to open the door because that person alone has the handle. That's you. That's me. Every human being. Jesus thirsts. He said it on the cross. I thirst. For what does he thirst? Our souls. He wants us to be in his kingdom, but he will not force us there. He waits patiently. You may remember the saying of Lord Acton of England who said, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely except in one authority. Jesus, the king. He has all the power of the world, but he will not force it upon you. He is the Lord of the entire universe, but he waits patiently. You see, the one thief, all he was interested in was being rescued. But the other thief wanted to be redeemed. That's the difference. One just wanted a quick fix. And the other wanted to be part of the kingdom. Like that second grader. Reminds me of a, a young man who had gone to the seminary. Mark, raised in a devout Catholic family. And he goes on seeking to serve the Lord in the priesthood. And it was about the time of the Vietnam War reaching a crescendo. You will recall, like in Hong Kong, we see today all the riots in the cities. You may remember there were riots in many of our cities here in the United States. A lot of violence, death, in fact. And so Mark left the seminary. He was very uh, disturbed by all of this, and he joined in in many of the revolts, and his parents were so surprised what happened. He even began to belittle his former Catholic faith. Till one day, he was driving by a Catholic church and on the sign he saw the name of the pastor. It was a priest he had known as a boy and respected a great deal and something moved him to pull over, park his car and go into church. It happened to be Good Friday. He slipped into the last pew of the church and Mark heard the old song, Were You There When They Crucified My Lord? And he began to weep. It moved his soul. And he began to remember the peace that he had when he would go to the Holy Week services as a boy. 
And something moved him as one row after another came up to venerate the cross. He got in line. And when he got to the cross and he kissed the cross, he said later, it was like I was a reborn Catholic. And he started coming back to his faith stronger than ever before and never regretted a day thereafter. They'd come back to Christ. You see, Christ is waiting for you. Whether it was in the last moment of life, like that thief on the cross, or whether it's today or in your youth, Christ waits because he loves us. Whether you understand why, as that young seminarian said, I don't know why I was moved to pull over and park my car. Well, when the Holy Spirit moves, often we can't explain it. It's an inner calling. Answer the call. Respond to Christ because he needs us. You are his ambassador in the world. He is relying on you. You are the agents of the king. The kingdom of darkness is spreading, right, exponentially. You see the hate. You see the violence. Jesus needs us to be the agents of the real kingdom. It may be a hidden kingdom, but you pray about it every day, don't you? When you say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom reigns perfectly in heaven, but not so much on earth. We have to correspond to the graces. There was a great writer, <clears throat> St. John Eudes, who spoke about the coming of the kingdom in us. And this is how he put it. We, quote, we must strive to follow and fulfill in ourselves the various stages of Christ's plan as well as his mysteries and frequently beg him to bring them to completion in us and in the church. For the mysteries of Jesus are not yet completely perfected and fulfilled. They are complete indeed in the person of Jesus, but not in us who are his members. Notice you heard in the second reading, Paul to the Colossians, that he is the Lord of the church, his mystical body. Then St. John continues. He said, he, Jesus, desires us to perfect the mystery of his incarnation and birth by forming himself in us and being reborn in our souls through the blessed sacraments of baptism and the Eucharist. He then fulfills his hidden life in us. He, Jesus, intends to perfect the mysteries of his passion, death, and resurrection by causing us to suffer, die, and rise again with him and in him. And finally, he wishes to fulfill in us the state of his glorious and immortal life when he will cause us to live a glorious eternal life with him in heaven. Unquote. You see how this kingdom is to take place in us? Hence we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, this piece of earth, right? As it is in heaven. So, as we come to worship the Lord today and to give him thanks for opening up this kingdom to us, perhaps like the good thief, we too might say, remember me, Lord, when you come into your kingdom. Don't forget me, Lord. And I promise I won't forget you. I'll open the door for you. And so I conclude with the words of a great hymn to the king that go this way. Praise my soul, the king of heaven. To his feet your tribute bring. Ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven. Evermore his praises sing. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise the everlasting King. Amen.